Well, good afternoon. Webinar series for the summer of 2020. My name is Dan Gropper, and I have the honor of serving as Dean of the College of Business here at Florida Atlantic University. We have three great guests here to talk about various aspects of financial markets uh, today. First, we have Bob Rubin, who's on our board of trustees here at FAU, who's a proud graduate of the University of South Florida, president of Rubin Wealth Advisors and Your401KSource.com. He's going to talk a little bit about aspects of financial markets and the turbulence right now for individuals and your retirement. Uh, in addition, we have Brian Evans, who's the Senior Vice President and CFO of the GEO Group, here, headquartered here in Boca. Uh, and he's going to talk a bit about the corporate uh, aspects of the financial market turbulence we see here and debt versus equity. They're a large publicly traded uh, corporation. And uh, we're glad to have him here. So welcome, Brian. He's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and also a Navy veteran. So thank you for being here and thank you for your service. In addition, uh, we're very pleased to have a great friend of Florida Atlantic University, Van Hip, uh, down from Washington, D.C. Van, thank you for making the trip down here. Van represents FAU in many, many things. Uh, he has a distinguished career in the military as well. Uh, he served in the U.S. Army, a variety of active duty uh, uh, situations. He's a recipient of the Bronze Star uh, medal and also was uh, incredibly uh, recently recognized with the Queen Elizabeth 9-11 National Security uh, Award in 2018. He's a very proud graduate of Wofford College in South Carolina and a graduate of the University of South Carolina Law School and served under George Bush Sr. as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army. Uh, he runs now a, a, a consulting group in Washington, D.C., and has considerable expertise in security threats, particularly cybersecurity threats that face all of us and a lot of businesses and have some aspects here in financial markets. So, Van, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Bob, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in the current situation in markets and how that might affect people's uh, 401ks and retirement plans. Thank you, Dan. You know, what, what's going on with a 401k business? What kind of changes? And the reality is, is not just with this current virus situation, but uh, in the last six months, we've had two major acts that were passed by Congress and signed by the president. And the last one that we had prior to that was 13 years ago. So we literally had no legislation for 13 years. And in the last six months, we've had really significant major uh, legislation that made all sorts of changes. I mean, I've lists and listed, it's pages upon pages of changes. But um, basically what it's come down to is they've made it easier for a business to start a 401k. So, for example, there used to be a $500 tax credit, which is pretty much de minimis to help you get started with one if you, you have a small business. But now they made it $5,000. There's even more credits if you have different features on it, for example, auto enrollment and, and things like that. Um, the other thing that's really interesting that, that's come out with a 401k, and there's a, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, is they've made it much easier for people to get money out of a 401k. And this, there's some philosophical stuff about that as to whether people should be taking this money out of the retirement plan, but it has gotten significantly easier to get money out. Um, the, other, the other really cool thing is that there's a lot more technology that's available. So it isn't like you're doing it alone. You really have all the different um, plan record keepers that, that offer 401ks. They have really, really neat technology involving risk analysis so you can make sure that the portfolios that you have are correct the kind of amount of risk you might want to take. Um, there's better security than there used to be, which I know that's something we're going to be talking about. There's a lot better financial planning that's sort of built in, and you get all this stuff for free as part of your, your, part of your plan. So there's a lot, there's lists and lists and lists of all sorts of changes that have happened in the last six months. Bob, uh, before I let you, let me ask one question. There's been a lot of ups and downs in the, in the financial markets uh, just since COVID got started. Um, are there, is there one big mistake that consumers make trying to manage their 401k in this kind of market turbulence? Yeah, easy. They go to cash. And they shouldn't go to cash. Should they cash out before they should. should exactly. Let it, let it ride. Yep. All right, we'll come back and talk a little bit more in detail. Um, Brian, we want to ask you what kind of things you're seeing from a corporate CFO and a publicly traded corporation. From your perspective, what are some of the key issues that you're seeing? Well... Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me here, first of all. Um, obviously, it's, it's a unique time, a unique period. We always say every, every 
new period is a unique period, and there's, <laughs> but, the, but the rules uh, don't seem to change. But there has uh, obviously been some significant effort by the Federal Reserve to inject a lot of liquidity into the market. I think it's early to see how that's going to impact the market, but um, and it's, I think it's industry-specific how different industries are affected by what's going on, uh, depending on what's happening in their businesses. Some companies are having harder access to capital, uh, and other companies are, are uh, accessing capital at some of the best prices they've ever seen. So it really is uh, industry specific and company specific. And there's, you know, uh, the, the convertible debt market is at uh, record issuances because some companies who couldn't access the bond markets are going over here to get money. But there's still a lot of liquidity out there. And the Federal Reserve, I think, has done a lot to inject a lot of liquidity into the market. Yeah, they, they certainly have. I was joking with the panel earlier that earlier in my career, before I became the dean, uh, I used to teach a course in money and financial markets, and we talk about the Federal Reserve behavior. And the Federal Reserve is currently doing a lot of things I said they would never do. Uh, so if I go back to teaching that class, I'll, I'll clearly have to really update some of the things that uh, we talked about there. Uh, next with us is, is Van Hip, and Van, as I said, has a, a special knowledge in security and cybersecurity issues. Van, I know you've got a couple of slides to work sure. through about some of the latest threats and some things for businesses and individuals to consider. So please walk us through uh, yeah, let's some of go, that. Yeah, let's go through them. And this, during these times, and, and we've seen the threats to uh, business, both the big and small, uh, with what they've been going through. Um, and it, it's affecting business in so many ways, Dean, uh, and we're seeing uh, you know theft of intellectual property, you name it. So I'm going to go just by, uh, through very quickly and talk about some of these increased threats and uh, what are some of the things that uh, businesses can do to protect themselves. Uh, this is the most, the cyber war that we're involved in right now is the most complex national security threat this country's ever faced. And one of the reasons is because technology is changing faster than our ability to adapt. So as the, as the, uh, as the technologies increase, the threats are growing exponentially. And, and I call it the fifth dimension of warfare after air, land, sea, and space, cyber war is the fifth dimension. And it affects everything. And people think, well, it's just, it's our national security, it's our, uh, it's our infrastructure, it's our economic security. All businesses, all commercial sectors uh, have been affected by this. And our financial institutions, we, we can talk about that later when we get to the Q&A, but uh, I'm very concerned there. And a lot of people talk about, hey, well, I've got to still keep doing business. I haven't been able to, to go to work. I'm working remotely. What type of collaboration a platform do I have? And many times, you're, if you pick the wrong platform, you're inviting eavesdropping by people who aren't too friendly to this country. Mm. So uh, the National Security Agency came out uh, a few weeks ago with these guidelines, which I think are great. And I've written a couple pieces recently and, and explored the different outfits out there, your different uh, 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 collaboration platforms. And what I have said, take a look. You make the decision. If security is important to you and the security of your transactions are important to you, do a side-by-side -side comparison of the different collaboration platforms against the NSA guidelines. Then let, let's talk about the attacks on businesses. How about all these ransomware attacks and and uh, viruses, people hear about viruses, phishing attacks, everything that's going on right now, uh, it's affected. These ransomware attacks in particular, we've seen a, a, a big increase. And it's really affected state and local governments and small businesses. Small businesses uh, in 2018 alone, before uh, what we're going through right now, 71% of ransomware attacks targeted small businesses, and the average ransom was $116,000. The NIST also looked at this, and, you know, from a cyber security standpoint. And NIST, of course, is part of our Department of Commerce. I'm a big fan of what they've come out with. And one of the things that they said, and this particularly applies to businesses, to small businesses, what type of antivirus or anti-malware uh, software do you have? <coughs> a lot of people th say, well, I just let my CO take care. That's a business decision, whatever the cheapest is. Let me tell you something. Every ransomware attack that I've seen be successful against a small business, I've not seen one that was based on what we call whitelisting. And that's very important. And NIST talks about this. You want to make sure in your business, particularly in this environment, that your software, your antivirus software or anti-malware software 
is based on whitelisting, not blacklisting. There's a big difference. And whitelisting only lets in the known good guys. Blacklisting says, well, we're not going to let in the known bad guys. Well, guess what? A bad guy is a bad guy. He or she's going to find out another way to come in and attack your network. So insist. Talk to, you, have, talk to your CEO and insist that you have uh, that type of software. And you're going to see this in the future. This is a biggie. If, if you're a business, small, large, I don't care if you're a mom and pop shop, if you want to do business with the federal government in the future, you're going to have to show some type of uh, cyber defenses. And it's going to impact the degree of which you can bid on a contract, the amount that you'll be able to bid. The Defense Department is starting this. I think it's long overdue. You, we're already starting to see other agencies, other departments talk about it, and our allies. And lastly, like I said, it's, uh, this is the most complex um, national security threat we've ever faced and one we've been the most unprepared for. And I like to go back and look at the, the tools that Winston Churchill used and how he broke the Enigma code. And we can use so many of those tools today. But here's what's interesting. The quantum race, Dean, is what's going to, whoever wins the quantum race, is going to win the cyber war. And that's going to affect financial transactions, our national defense, health records, everything. And when I, people ask me, what is quantum? And we're being outspent 30 to 1 by China right now. Speed, speed, speed. Think of, think of computing that is millions of times faster than we have right now. Fortunately here, and, and you've got a hidden gem right here at Florida Atlantic University, I would say FAU is one of the two leading universities in the United States today mm -hmm. on winning the quantum race. You've got some real hidden talent here. You've got one professor who ran the joint DOD, DOE quantum physics lab. I mean, that kind of talent right here working with our government to win the quantum race because whoever wins it is going to win the cyber war. It's fascinating stuff, uh, Van, and, and also a little bit scary. Let me just get you before we go to around, expand a little bit on that quantum stuff. So we talk about, I've heard about quantum physics, quantum mechanics, quantum computing. Yeah. Expand on, the, on what that is and why it's so important here. It really gets back to speed. So if, if I could have the greatest, it gets the speed of computing. So I could have the most sophisticated weaponry in the world. Uh, but if you're faster than me and you can hack my system and shut it down before I can do anything, and you, but you have inferior defense technology, guess who wins? And we're also seeing attacks on the grid. Mm -hmm. So the goal will be to have uh, quantum technologies, maybe put on a chip that we could put on our systems, we could put on banking systems, we could put on our grid to secure our grid. So there's a race going on right now. And it's the United States and our, and our allies basically versus China is what's taking place right now. And unfortunately, we've been outspent 30 to one in recent years. Uh, and it's, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but uh, this to me is the most important uh, race going on right now for this country. So if you combine that quantum computing, that ability to run through things faster and faster and yeah. faster, even pretty complicated passwords, yeah. the computers can just generate all those combinations. It, it, by hand yeah. in a person, it could take years. By an old computer, it might take days and weeks. By quantum computing, it might take minutes. Correct. Is that the idea? And they use something called random number generation. Right. I go back to that movie, what was it, uh, The Imitation Game, yeah. and how they broke the code. And if you remember, the bad guys would change the code every 24 hours, yep. and the good guys, but they wouldn't post it till like 6 o'clock in the morning. They had 18 hours to uh, crack the code. What if they were changing every second or two? That's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> we, okay, we have we have a question. Um, there been an increase in cybersecurity attacks in the remote environment of COVID nineteen. If so, any particular areas? All right. So I guess I could they hear you? Or do I need to repeat that question? Repeat it. So the the question was: Has there been an increase in these cybersecurity hacks during the COVID time period due to being shut down? I guess, Van, I'll start with you and then see if you guys mention that in these areas. The what FBI, do you see? The FBI says there's been a 400% increase in cyber attacks during COVID-19. 400%. Bob, do you see additional security issues with people's 401k in there? Yeah, it's interesting that until recently, I've never had a call from a participant or a company's never had a call from a participant that said, hey, they think that they, they would somebody try to hack their account. That's uh, literally the first time. 
And um, so that has recently started happening. And what we tell people regularly is uh, we only use uh, companies that have two-factor authentication. And that's just what we tell everybody. And, and it's funny because when, when people sign up, you know, we'll change a company and we'll, we'll go into the company. There's 300 employees in there and they all got to get signed up and all that and their phones and all that. And they want to make it the simplest password. They want to make it the simplest username. They want to make it as easy as they possibly can. And we're constantly trying to teach people, no, it's got to be a complicated password. Quantum is not here yet, so like at least if you want to have complicated, want to have a long password, that seems to be the rule right now. Is don't have a don't have an easy password. You have it as long as you possibly can. And everybody that we work with uses two-factor authentication. For those of you who don't know what two-factor authentication is, or two FA for short, is it's not just where you are, in other words, right here, but it also has to be another device. So it'll show up on your phone, or it goes to your computer with a code, and the code we all are starting to use that now and type that in. I think people are absolutely crazy to not use 2FA for bank accounts, for 401k accounts, anything that involves, um, that involves money. As a matter of fact, I, I even take it one step further. I recommend that people go to a secure type of email system now. Like, don't use Yahoo, don't use Google. Those are not really truly secure email systems. There are companies out there that offer true secure email. And actually, they offer stuff for free even. And you really want to use it just for your financial accounts Use a specific email address, use two-factor authentication, and you have a much better shot. You, you know, basically, if you don't have 2FA, you're low-hanging fruit. If you have an easy password, you're low-hanging fruit. It's all these people trying to get your money. So if you do all these additional steps, I just think it makes it that much harder for people to get at your money. Sure, and we want to make it hard to get at our money. Yes. Absolutely. Um, Brian, what, do you, what kind of security threats are you seeing? And after all, Geo is a security-based company. <laughs> so uh, you, you guys ought to be as well equipped to handle this as anybody. But what kind of threats are you seeing uh, on your side? Well, I, I think on the cybersecurity side, we're definitely, we have seen an increase in the attacks. I don't know how much of it's COVID-related because, as I'm sure Van can attest, it just keeps going up and up. It's not slowing down. The s attacks become more sophisticated, more frequent. Great. Uh, it doesn't stop. So I think companies to some degree are always a little bit behind where the hackers are coming from because they're oftentimes the innovators and you're trying to catch up to what they're innovating. Um, but uh, so we're, we're constantly ch uh, adding additional security measures. Most of, uh, uh, if you're changing your password or your offsite, there's a two-factor authentication. There's often, it's going through some sort of secure uh, service device to get your um, email offsite. We've limited people who are trying to access remotely the ways in which they can access and get into the network to, to reduce the opportunities for those phishing attacks. And it just continually, you know, the, 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 the CIO came to me and Bob mentioned secure passwords or, or whitelisting. So our, our, one of the things that we're, we're looking at and is pushing is don't allow any emails in from like Gmail, Yahoo, any of those types of accounts let alone whether or not it's uh, a, a, a recognized email, but just don't let uh, emails in from certain domain names. Certain mm -hmm. domains, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I imagine, too, you're probably paying your people remotely, so you need a bank account and so to do direct deposits and that sort of thing. And that's something that the security on that, we've got to make sure that some hacker doesn't get in and redirect your payroll. Yeah, and right? there, there's, a, there's significant... Um, security measures on those um, banking platforms that we use, because all the banking is pretty much remote. You know, we're doing yes. wire transfers, we're doing um, all the payments through remote processes and online with the bank's system. So those are, have uh, significant security measures in them. And then within the organization, we have to be uh, very careful, and we receive the emails regularly. You know, I get an email that's from the CEO supposedly that says, you know, send $5 million here. It's been a top secret transaction. Uh, you know, I'm just making you aware now. And, <laughs> you know, they don't know that the CEO is one floor above me, and I just call him and ask him, but it does work at some companies. And they get very sophisticated on the, um, the knowledge that they put in there and try to personalize it a little. So, uh, constantly have to be on the toes, on your toes. We're constantly trying to train our employees every month with updates and things like that, but it's a never-ending battle. Yeah, on a much smaller scale, I'll relate that this weekend I had uh, emails from two of my faculty that someone had spoofed my email. They hadn't actually hacked and got in it, but just said, hey, give me a call, please check on this, you know, 
Dean Dan Gropper. Right. And it wasn't me, and they were both smart enough to just send this to me, and I let the IT security guys know. But it really was, uh, it, it looked pretty good. Uh, and I, I, of course, wasn't asking them to wire five million dollars anywhere. They would, they would be suspicious of that. But we, we've had that happen with a few executives, and where their their email just becomes spam. They'll get hundreds of emails, yes. and and one of the things that we're looking at, which it's 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 a balance between what's user friendly and for the company. You know, you block all these email addresses. You're not going to get your email from your wife or a friend or whatever. Um, but also now considering changing email addresses. A lot of companies have a simple email structure like first name, last name, or first name, dot, last name, or first Figure initial. Figure out who you are. So, you know, we're looking at, for at least certain key positions, just changing to some sort of random email address so it's much harder to uh, fish that email, if you will. Yeah, those phishing schemes. Now, Van, uh, you mentioned a couple of these threats, and particularly one that has popped up with COVID. I had not done a WebEx uh, meeting until a month ago, and now I usually do at least two or three a day, WebEx and Zoom. Are these platforms the kind of thing that become, uh, when you're installing new software, obviously you're opening up your computer systems in some ways. You mentioned that in your perceived threats. Has this become, these platforms become a way that hackers can get in your computer, access your financial information, oh, yeah. and then... Uh, you need to look and see, if you're going to use a platform, where was that or is that platform developed? Where are they doing the research? In China, they've got laws that if you're doing research in China, uh, they want to, uh, you, you've got to give a copy of your encryption keys or whatever to the Chinese government. So just keep that in mind. Do a little homework. Uh, look at the NSA guidelines uh, and compare it against the different platforms and then, and then make a decision of uh, uh, how, how much you value security. I'd like, to, I'd like to comment on what Brian talked about. You know, with us, a big part of what we have to worry about is PII or personal identifiable information. Yeah. So we have regulations that we can't send any email or any, anything, really, fax. Some people think that's another interesting with fax. People still use faxes, and they think that they're secure, and they're not. Um, but that they will send us statements. They'll send us all sorts of documents that have their personal identifiable information on it. And it's like, you know, all these different tools that we talk about to try to keep things safe. If you put it across the email with your basic information from a social engineering standpoint, it makes it that much easier for the bad guys to figure out who you are, whether it's a social security, social security number, it could be a date of birth, your complete full name. You know, when you start putting all that information together, right. it just becomes so much easier for, for somebody to be able to hack you. So it, it's really incumbent upon us as individuals to really think about, wait a second, Let's not send that statement. Let's not send this personal identifiable information. Don't text it. I mean, all these, these, um, these platforms are not as secure as people think they are. Uh, so really need to be careful about how, how you do that. And also, the phishing expeditions that are going on right now, and I don't mean FIS, I mean PHIS. Yeah. It's, the emails that we get are really good now. I mean, oh, yeah. I get emails and I'm like, wow, is that, you know, like, is it real? I kind of know it's not, but I admire the, the how, how much creativity went into that, how much work went into that email. And so you do have to continuously uh, teach your employees as to like what to look for because it looks real. Yeah, a absolutely. The, they're getting better and better. The, the old days about a Nigerian prince who's going to give you a cut of a <laughs> couple million dollars, are, they're, they're, they're gone. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me ask you this, Bob. Back to uh, some more mundane things. We know there have been some substantial regulatory changes in the 401k space and, and a bunch of things and, and, uh, that have happened in Washington, D.C. as part of a uh, measure, set of measures to try to help people get through both this health crisis and the financial uh, crisis that kind of comes along with it that's sort of brewing. Um, if if you are someone who has responsibility for your company's 401k. You know, what kinds of things should you be concerned about? Which regulatory changes should you be most aware of? So there was, there was two main acts that got passed. The SECURE Act passed in uh, 2019, and the CARE Act pack passed back in March. And they all had uh, a lot of a laundry list, and I don't know if I'm all memorized, but a laundry list of items that you can that change your 401k. And there was some small ones, for example, that you can, and this is also private sharing plans and also defined benefit plans too, by the way, 
Um, for example, if, if you're having a baby or if you're going to adopt a baby, you get $5,000. It's new. Um, you don't get, uh, you don't have to pay your, you have to pay the tax, but you don't have to pay a penalty. One of the biggest ones though, is all the different ways that you're allowed to get money out of your 401k for either withdrawal or a loan. Used to be there was a limit, basically 50% of your balance up to $50,000. Now it's hundred percent of your balance up to a hundred thousand dollars. And they even delay the payment back for a year. Now, they did that really, you know, we, they passed all that, that law came out, that was part of the CARES Act back in March, and that was everybody's worried about where people are gonna get money from, but, but if you think about it, and, and I have a, a serious philosophical concern about this, that if you allow somebody to take $100,000 out of their account, right, uh, first of all, they have to pay it back within five years. You might have a delay of up to a year, but it's a, it's a five-year payback. Um, right off the bat, even if it's a very low interest rate, it's about $850 a paycheck, Right, if say you can pay twice a, twice a year or twice a month, I mean. So I don't care how much money you're making. $850 net coming right off the top is tough. The second thing that's kind of uh, that's difficult about that, if you leave during that five-year time period, whatever's left over, say you, you paid off $50,000 and there's still $50,000 outstanding, if you leave, you have 90 days to cure that loan. So you have to pay back that $50,000. If you don't, you get a 1099. That hurts. I mean, really a guy making 100,000, 50, 75,000, whatever that might be, and he has a fifty thousand dollar ten ninety nine on the day that he leaves employment. That's pretty painful. So, um, and I've had this is this is the other thing that's really changed. In the last two months, it's a dozen or a couple dozen of hundred thousand dollars withdrawals out of four hundred one k's. It's astonishing to me. I mean, why do people need that money all of a sudden? I mean, like they're a little short on rent. I mean, you don't take a hundred thousand. You can take a thousand or a couple thousand. Why would you take a hundred? And that's a lot of money to take out. And now you're going to start having an $850 net uh, ch- coming out of your check every single pay period. So those are some of the things. Um, uh, and there's just all sorts of distributions. Uh, required minimum distributions now used to be age 70. Now it's age 72, uh, which is nice. And so if you're still working for a company, you don't have to put money into it. You, you don't have to start taking money out of that 401k. It's kind of money going in and money coming out. That gets delayed a couple of years. So there are some advantages on that. But um, they generally just made it easy for people to take money out of your 401k. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole line of, of research in the behavioral economics and finance literature about nudges of various sorts and getting people Big to nudge. make better, better decisions. And, and this is one where you worry about you know, oh. people making decisions that seem like the thing to do now that really hurt them uh, down the road a little bit. Yeah. Um, Brian, if, if I go to you a little bit, Bob's looking at helping people with their 401ks, so your stock may be in people's 401ks. So uh, with this COVID, you know, with all this turbulence in the financial markets, all the ups and downs and the volatility, the volatility in the markets has just been at record highs uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, the VIX number is, you know, just huge. Now, that's, that's of concern for me. How does it affect you as a CFO, does this affect your, your daily operations, your decision making? Um, you know, I, I don't, I watch the stock market, but not from that perspective. I'm obviously a personal investor, but to the degree that the stock is more volatile for the company, it's certainly going to impact the, um, the access to the equity markets and the timing of when you would want to access the equity markets if you needed equity. Uh, our preference as a company, and I think most companies, is to go to debt markets. Debt capital is cheaper than equity capital. Um, but if there's a lot of volatility in the market, you know, you may be forced to go do something when you wouldn't necessarily want to because you don't know what's going to be there when you do need it. So I, I think that is a, a, a factor for companies now that it maybe wasn't historically wasn't when there wasn't this level of volatility that you have right now. Yeah, I, uh, what I've heard from discussions with some of my finance colleagues uh, and then other people in the in investment space is there's a little bit of just un- general uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Not, not risk, but you know, when Frank Knight made this distinction between risk and uncertainty, it's just uncertainty. Yeah. People, it's hard to calibrate what's going to happen next. Uh, but in addition, there's this sort of real rise of algorithms and program trading that it's not people. Right. Now making these decisions is a much people making writing programs and then programs making these trades. Uh, 
Are, does that really affect you guys very much? Do you affect your access to capital, or is it just something that's now blending into the background? I, that's, I think that's been going on for a while, first yeah. of all. It's been evolving. Um, it, it affects our company or any company. You know, sometimes our stock can be event-driven, so if a negative uh, news article or maybe even a positive or something comes out, you can see the company trade off significantly. And I think it is driven by those types of algorithm type traders and, uh, you know, market movers or, mar you know, mar momentum plays. And uh, so it, it definitely has an impact. Okay. Well, if I circle back to, to Van a little bit, Van, let me ask you a question about the particular threats that banks uh, and other financial institutions may face that are, are a little bit different or maybe different in kind uh, from those of just other companies. Uh, what kind of specific threats do you see to banks um, and, and other large financial institutions? Well, you have to look at our adversaries and, and I look at the different types of attacks and you, you have to understand the motives. The Chinese are more about, the Chinese government is more, or more about espionage. They're trying to steal things. They're trying to get your stuff. Uh, General Keith Alexander, of our former uh, uh, NSA director, who headed up Cyber uh, uh, Command, said that uh, businesses in America lose, on average, $250 billion of intellectual property every year. And every year, the intellectual property on our, on our uh, government, our university, and our business platforms, we're losing more than is in the entire Library of Congress. Okay, Now, every year. Now, but the Chinese are about the IP and stealing what we got. The Iranians, historically, are not about espionage. They're about sabotage. They're trying to take down systems. So a few years ago, I actually wrote a book called The New Terrorism, How to Fight It and Defeat It, and we looked at some of the uh, Iranian attacks on banking systems in this country, and we're talking primarily about the distributed denial of service attacks. Here's what I'm talking about. Banks are just being flooded. They're being flooded with all kinds of requests so that their customers can't even, you know, do the things that they need to do, like get on a website or maybe get cash out of an ATM. So that's what we're saying a lot uh, is, is just this. Uh, and, and those are types of phishing attacks, but just flooding what will those actually uh, distributed denial of service attacks. But they're just flooding the banks. So it's tougher for banks to conduct business. That's a big concern. Mm. Is there any there any? other specific things you see with other corporations that might relate to their financial transactions. I think Bob and you were both alluding to this a little bit with like payroll and data, social security numbers, tax information, addresses, other things. First of all, I thought what y'all said was perfect, uh, spot on about changing your, changing your emails, not having too simple of emails, having the two-factor uh, uh, authentication. Those are things you got to do, but I also... And, and something we've done in my company is uh, security awareness training. So we'll have someone sending emails out to our employees to see if they're going to open it up, mm -hmm. and uh, and if they to see if they're taking debate uh, in, in, a, in an effort to train and educate them on what not to be opening up. Those are the kinds of things you got to do. Mm. It's a different world. The, the, the security used to be make sure that your paycheck wasn't stolen out of your. <laughs> Out of your mailbox. Now it's uh, it's a whole different kind of thing. Well, I don't want to ruin ruin what I said about the two FA, but this is this is true. I just read this a couple weeks ago. Is now you can spoof a SIM card, if you know what that means. So basically, they can take over your SIM card. So what they're doing for really sophisticated attacks now is, and I know I'm saying all this when I just got done saying you should do two FA. You should do two FA. But if they're really trying to set you up, they do social engineering. They figure the basic information they need about you. And then they know that you're going to they're going to do a transaction. It's going to go to your phone. So at the same time, they go ahead and they spoof your SIM card. They now have control of your phone. Goes to your phone, which is really now they control it. They now have the code. They put the code in, and they now have the transaction done. The money gets wired to wherever they want to wire the money. And I, I honestly don't know how. There's probably a way of stopping that from happening. Um, but when I read when I saw this and I read it, it was true, it, it, it scared the heck out of me, to be quite honest with you. <laughs> but I think generally long passwords two FA and you pay attention, don't send personal identifiable information and have a really good secure email system, I think you're gonna eliminate ninety-nine percent of the problems. 
All right. Well, let me, let me ask you, if you had people now, if you were advising someone who had a pretty substantial balance uh, in their 401k, let's say at least, uh, well, a bit over a million dollars, say, and you were giving them uh, uh, some advice and, and they had maybe 20 years before they were going to retire, um, how would you advise them to respond to this COVID crisis uh, if there was, you know, if you, if you were advising some, some pretty successful, you know, 40-year-old who'd been able to establish that to this point? So that's a good question. And the advice that I'm going to give him is going to be the same advice that I'm going to give a person who uh, just got started and, and she's got $10,000 in her account. It's the same, same kind of advice that sort of applies to everybody. And, and of, all the community edu- of all the employee education uh, meetings that we've done over the last uh, really three or four months, uh, to that question is what we teach people is to treat their old money and their new money differently. So what, that, what does that basically mean? Your new money is your contribution, stuff that's coming in from your paycheck that's getting deducted. You're, you're doing something called dollar cost averaging. There's new money going in, whether it's you get paid every week, every other week, twice a month, whatever it is. And your old money is the existing money that's already in there, your balance, right? So because of the way a 401k is set up, it's kind of easy to do what I'm going to say, which is, versus if you had a, just your own pile of money, there's not new money coming in regularly. What I'm about to say is you kind of can't do it. But with a 401k, you can. It kind of works like this is because of the volatility that everybody's nervous, and we talked about at the beginning, what's the one thing I tell people not to do is go to cash, and people do, they, they are kind of freaked out about this. Now, with the market going up the way it is, the, the sort of the, their, their heightened anxiety is down a little bit, but when it, when, it, when it goes down again, it's gonna go right back up. You know, the anxiety is gonna go up. So what we tell people to do is to treat their new money more conservatively. Take some of the conservative choices that are available in your 401k, um, I'm sorry, I said that opposite. As the new money comes in, get you more aggressive with that money or even where it is right now. So you're taking advantage of the volatility of the market, dollar cost averaging in, you're, you're, you're buying a fixed amount of, of, of an asset, right? And it has varying share price. So when it goes down, you buy more shares. When you go, when it goes up, you're buying less shares. And then on your existing balance or your old money, go more conservative, right? And if you just do that, right? That alone will reduce the volatility of your account. And if you pair that with a lot of the risk management techniques and tools that are available now in the 401k world, there's all sorts of stuff out there to sort of measure your risk tolerance. So how you feel about risk versus, and then you can compare that to how, what your portfolio is set up. So if you do those balances, um, you'll have lower volatility. And even if the VIX as high as it is, um, your account won't move as much and yet you're taking advantage of that volatility by being more aggressive with that new money coming in. It's actually, it's a little difficult to set up, but not that hard. Whoever you're working with, your 401k will be able to tell you how to do that. But just that simple strategy alone will save you a lot of heartache, and you'll end up with a lot more money down the road than not. Now, that doesn't work with somebody who's going to retire in a couple of years, but your example of 20 years, whether you have $10,000 or a $1 million, it works. Yeah, it's good. It, and there is another finding in the literature uh, in the finance literature generally, that people tend to ride stocks down yes. and sell them low more often because they just sort of panic and say, I just got to stop this. This is the opposite of that. Yes, exactly. Right. So what you're talking about is adopting a behavioral thing right. that kind of gives you a little bit of security so you're comfortable, uh, but allows you to take advantage of those longer-term trends, dollar-cost average, so you're getting, you know, uh, getting that benefit of that growth as it occurs. Yeah, there's behavioral finance in there, and it, oh, yeah. because or else the person can't kind of handle it. This exactly. way they do it by ignoring, but it just, it just gets done because they're ignoring it, it's just happening automatically. Yeah, you and set a rule and follow it. it. Right. Yeah, and, but it, it, that's, right, that's exactly right. But I, I can tell you the stress is real. Oh, yeah, no, I and hear yeah, it. I'm, I'm sure you, you, you deal with it with all the people <laughs> right. you advise. Right. Um, Brian, I'd like to turn back to you a little bit. Most of our students now were, were pretty young uh, in the last, in the financial crisis, 2008 uh, financial crisis. That was led by, uh, that was a financial crisis. So housing markets and so on got overheated and all, and all the rest. Um, talk about the difference from that crisis to this one and how that affects corporate finance decisions as you see it. Well, I think the, as you mentioned, it was a financial crisis, so there were, you know, there were real issues with the um, financial institutions at the time, uh, and uh, since then, uh, due to regulations and, and and law changes or statutory changes, 
uh, and just a, an overall strong economy for 10 plus years or nearly 10 years, mm -hmm. um, the financial institutions are in a much better shape, their balance sheets. Uh, you still saw some, some corporate actions that were similar to 08, 09, where you had sort of the run on the banks where companies you know, went out and drew down all their credit facilities. And, and even this go around, you had hundreds of billions of dollars drawn down. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I think the financial institutions are much stronger. And I don't think that anything that's happened thus far is really going to weaken them much. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's still a lot of liquidity in the market. There's still a lot of money being lent. The Federal Reserve acted much more quickly than it did last time and more aggressively. Uh, and I think that was part of uh, what they learned from the last go around. So it's still early. It'll, it remains to be seen how all this liquidity that's getting injected into the market affects uh, the market longer term. And I think it also remains to be seen how the economy comes back and how quickly it comes back. Because if it uh, comes back slowly or not as much as people are hoping, then you may have some longer term pressure on the financial institutions with corporate defaults and personal defaults and those types of things. And, and um, as you said earlier, you're, it's surprising that what the Fed has done. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I do think, you know, I don't have discussions with people at a high level there, but, you know, there's representatives in local markets that talk to the CFOs of companies and they will continue to be aggressive, I think, uh, and, and spur the mar market along because they don't want to see a significant recession or, you know, there may be some slowdown, they expect that, but they don't want a long, prolonged um, recession that does start to threaten the financial stability of the market. Yeah, I think there's a there's a, a, a trade off, at least in my in my interpretation as a, a financial economist, and the Federal Reserve over a long period of time has generally been willing to pursue a bit more inflation, mm -hmm. uh, especially because it's going to occur down the road a little bit, um, and I think we've set the stage for that now. There's just a huge injection uh, of money. At the same time, there's a collapse in the production of of real goods and services. Mm -hmm. And of course, that collapse came about because the government said, we've got to shut down. Right. And so when you do that and then you pump new money in, you know, you, you're going to produce inflation as long as the circulation of money doesn't just virtually stop, which it has slowed down. So there, there, it, will, it remains to be seen if we'll return to some of those longer term trends. Uh, I think we will, but I also think we want to get through a crisis and then we'll deal with the inflationary crisis down the road. Some of us are old enough to remember the, the mortgage rates that were 17, 18, yeah. 20%. And uh, those are very, very difficult, very turbulent times for, for other reasons. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's for those of us who have uh, gray hair and it's you know, retreating on our on our foreheads from the things too. The uh, lessons of the uh, 60s and 70s uh, and 80s are, are hard-earned hard, hard earned and hard-learned uh, lessons. Um, Van, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I just want to come back and see if I can ask all three of you about this. Uh, the single, if I'd ask uh, just a random assortment of, of alumni that I meet, when I talk to them about things, their single biggest fear uh, about online banking and online security is the one that we touched on right at the start of this, that somehow they would get online and they go to check their account and find suddenly it had been drained away. Hmm. Is that a realistic fear? Do people, should people, is that the kind of thing that should keep them up at night? And what could they do if they, if they detach all their online banking stuff and say, we're not going to do that, I'm going to have to go walk up to a teller if I can find one anymore. And they got to get stuff in the mail. There's even more risk with that. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say. So let's yeah. talk about the competing risks that we yeah. all face and, and what people can do and, and how these things interact. Because part of what you've laid out is, well, if you're getting on there and you're having a Zoom call with your grandchildren, have you now opened up your home PC to a phishing or some, you know, some malware attack that the next time when you go and sign into your your 401k account that now some bad actor is going to be able to mirror your keystrokes and boom. 
there goes you know, the money. Your, there goes your savings that was going to lead to a thing. Is that a realistic concern? or is, That scenario doesn't bother me. What, I'm, 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 I would be much more concerned with what I talked about earlier, that distributed denial of service attack where the banks are just flooded uh, with these mm -hmm. types of attacks and I'm not able to get out money when I need it at oh, a particular time. That, to me, is a greater concern. But something Brian said, I, uh, I want to get back to his, uh, something he said, and, and I agree with. He was talking also about you know where, where banks are in financial institutions today versus 2008 after the Lehman Brothers collapse. And it's good news that they are stronger, but looking at the cyber and security aspect, w securing our financial institutions have got to be a top priority in this country because those two big to fail banks have only gotten bigger. And you're seeing hacks, all the, it's like death by a thousand hacks. And I've spoken to a number of, of true experts on like ransomware, things like that. They tell me the banks are paying ransomware. They're paying ransomware. They're not telling you that. They're passing it on to their customers. Mm. So we've, and, you know, and there's not been one, to my knowledge, there's not been one prosecution of a ransomware attack because it's all, they're all using blockchain. This is a major, major threat. And the ransomware uh, 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 attacks, I think, are, are, are big time threats to our, to, our financial, to our financial institutions as well. So you think the threats are more at the financial institution level than they are at the individual level, but they're still of concern everywhere. There are things at the individual letter, I mean, level that you can do to be smart and improve your cyber hygiene is what they call it. All right, and what would you suggest those things to be? <laughs> those things that, that um, Brian and um, Bob have been talking about, you know, changing the passwords, uh, those types of things. Two-factor uh, authentication. Two-factor two authentication. Yeah. Those Don't use Wi-Fi in an airport. Don't use Wi-Fi at Starbucks and, and do financial transactions. Yeah. That's not a smart idea. Got a point. And on that virus, antivirus software, even in your home, Make sure it's based on whitelisting and not blacklisting. It's up to date, right? Yeah, so the, the whitelisting, just to be clear, is you have a list of approved sites and approved vendors and approved software you're going to use. Yes. So you don't use anything unless you know that That's it's right. good. And you can buy software based on whitelisting. There's, sure. there's something called a global whitelist. Yes. And that's what you want. So, I mean, you know, well, I saw this ad on TV. This is a big, big fancy company. Uh -uh. Is it based on whitelisting or blacklisting? you got to ask yourself that question. Also Very consider good. using a VPN. So for everybody, just remind us what a VPN is and how one would go getting one. So a VPN is a virtual private network, and it's a piece of software that basically creates a tunnel between your computer and the computer out on the web, so basically somebody can't hack into that. And they're not expensive. There's a lot of free versions that are out there. And it's, you know, there's different ones, supposedly better than others, but it's, you know, to your question, it's kind of a multi-layered approach, right? Right. All of these little things that you do to keep yourself safe. That's, that's the way I view it. I try to have safe, safe passwords. I try to have my Wi-Fi done properly. I try to have, uh, I have a, a, a firewall both at home and in my office. I use a VPN at home and in my office. I have a safe email. Um, uh, like I said, I don't use Yahoo or Google. I use, an, I use another safe one. If I, can I mention it? I, I use Proton, right? Proton right. is based in Switzerland and it's, it's a safer version. So, um, so all these little things add up. I don't send stuff over email or text it. Um, for my texting, I generally use Signal or WhatsApp. I don't use regular texting. All these little things help. All right. Well, now I'm worried about my regular texting. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. Brian, what kind of final comments might you have? I've gotten the, the last two minutes from here. So are there any final thoughts you'd, you'd care to leave us with? No, I'm ready for questions from the floor if we got some. We've got some. The first one is, how probable is it for cryptocurrency to be implemented widely for all kinds of day-to-day -day transactions? How probable? It's going to happen. Professor Rubin says it's going to happen. Brian, what do you think? I, I, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I really I don't. The visibility question is, is one, but Dan, what do it's you think? It's a ways off, and uh, as uh, the dean knows, I'm trying to get a, a real expert in this field to come speak at the School of Business. Yes, well, we look forward to that. One of, one of our faculty members does a lot of work with Bitcoin, and then two others are, are doing some research on cryptocurrency. But the one who's done a lot on Bitcoin, has been interviewed a lot, really looks at it from monetary history perspective and how money that is not dependent on its value from a government decree, how that works. Right. So that's a, that's a little different issue about its general usability as a, as a medium of exchange. Professor. Question. 
To piggyback on Brian Evans' default comment, we're likely to see a significant number of businesses look at bankruptcy restructuring options. Do you think there is going to be a market reaction as that activity increases? So I think um, to that point, what I was talking about earlier, does the economy come back quickly? And I'm not an economist, but I think if you look at where the stock market is today, there's an implication that the market is, the economy is coming back quickly. And I think some of that is because the Federal Reserve has injected so much money into the market and the federal government has injected so much money into the market. But if it's a slower recovery or it's a flat line recovery, then you are going to start to see uh, bankruptcies, foreclosures, and that kind of stuff. And then you could get in a, in a kind of a quagmire, a stagnant situation. So um, we'll just have to see how it plays out, I think. Bob, would you, you have anything else to add to that? Well, in the last 10 years, I think the Fed gave uh, digitally created, was it $1.4 or $1.6 trillion over that 10-year time period, liquidity into the market, buying bonds, et cetera. And what, in the last four months, they digitally created, what, four or three or four point five trillion dollars yeah. mm-hmm. and they're, they're not just buying bonds anymore they're really buying junk bonds and now they're going to start buying equities yeah i mean I, when does that ever stop so uh what are we 26 trillion dollars of outstanding debt on the market so uh you know it, it does create liquidity in the market it'll cause the economy to continue to hum along it'll reduce foreclosures it'll reduce bankruptcies but at some point we got to pay the piper I, w- I would just add, and Van, do you have anything you want to add before I make a comment? So I'll add the comment that, uh, in fact, I think the Federal Reserve, by keeping interest rates so low, is pushing up the values of equities. The money that's in the market is going to have to find something. And so it's pushing better up the values of equities yeah. as, as a better alternative. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say is one area that does concern me uh, is the commercial real estate sector. There's a lot of retail pressure. There's a lot of retailers uh, restaurants and others in that small commercial space, but even that office have been space. pressured. Yeah. yeah, and office space because now you may have a longer term trend. We're people getting, working from home. Many people yeah. do it, so that may be a, a longer term decline in demand in that space. And as that decline in the commercial real estate market ripples through, I think that has yet to show up. Yeah, that's going to be a little longer. Mm-hmm. Siri, Thank you. let me ask you to repeat this too before you answer it. We have lots of future financial professionals here at FAU, um, what would you recommend to them to be as desirable as possible in this job market? All right, so I'll repeat the question and then point to the panel to answer it. Uh, And that is we have a lot of future finance professionals here, a lot of finance majors, a lot of economics majors, accounting majors who'd like to work in financial markets. What do each of you gentlemen see as things they can do to help prepare themselves for success, both short and, and longer term? Want to go first, Brian? <laughs> <I'll go. laughs> you know, and we actually hire quite a few uh, grads from FAU, uh, entry level accounting and finance from both uh, undergrad and MBA. And I think, um, you know, just being on your game, being ready to work hard when you go into the finance or accounting professions and you're starting out entry level, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough environment. It's, it's, a, it's not a weed out environment, but there's hard work is expected. Uh, be analytical, try to be creative, um, be good with Excel. I think those, those things and, and maybe good with PowerPoint and presentations and being able to pull out, uh, you know, the key data and the key metrics and present it well so that executives or your managers can see that, that's going to that's gonna help set you apart and show that you, you know what you're looking at when you look at numbers and when you look at business stuff. Okay. Bob, would you add anything to that? I would say certifications. If you're going to go to work in a specific industry, get certified, whether it's real estate or finance. You get a CFP, you get a CFA. Um, So think about certifications also. Yeah, and and I will uh, add from my perspective, you've got to be strong technically. You've also got to be strong in your communications, and I think both of you have said that. You've got to be able to do the analytical work. You've got to be able to use the software. You've also got to be able to summarize it and present it well. Yeah. I I would only add, too, within finance, financial security. Uh, That's what we're talking about right now. How do we help secure our financial um, systems? Uh, There was an estimate by um, a a former CIA analyst I read. He said we need about 30,000 people to really thwart the worst types of attacks on our system in this country. We got maybe a couple thousand. 
who are really qualified. So financial security. Financial security, okay. We have a related job market question that might be interesting. It's about consulting or other positions that require travel on a near weekly basis. Um, repeat them. Sure. Uh, so the, the question was that uh, people are interested in consulting, and those jobs used to require a lot of travel on a, almost a weekly basis. Um, and so what's the second part of that question? Do we? What, what, are, what is the major restructuring going to look like there? Sure. What do, what do you guys see as a major restructuring there? Is that going to really change longer term, or, or are we still going to send these young people out on airplanes and... Well, I think, you know, you can't get away from that completely because I do think that there is a strategic advantage when people are face-to-face -face and they're trying to interact and you have large group settings. You can, you know, different people are trying to talk over each other and nobody's quite figured that out with technology. But there's also going to be less because the technology is getting better. People got ex exposed to these collaborative software environment, Zoom and whatnot. And I know speaking with some of our um, with our accounting firms or others that I know that are still in the field that they it's kind of shut down completely right now it's not going to stay like that but I do think it's going to um, be re reduced and it also will just depend on what happens long term with this disease if there's a cure or a vaccine or something like that you're going to return back to a more normalized level but it may be a new normal that's a little bit less travel but not, not nearly what it is today. But if it takes longer to get that and we keep having these pandemic breakouts, it's something new from China or someplace else, or then uh, you, you're going to continue to see it evolve, I think, because people are going to be uh, less inclined to do that. And businesses aren't forcing their people to do that. Businesses are not forcing their people to do that. Would you agree with that, Bob? Yeah, it's actually the opposite. I just got an email today. I was supposed to have a uh, breakfast meeting on uh, two days, and um, the, the guy said to me, I couldn't get approval from my company to meet, I'm not allowed to leave yet. Like people are just not even allowed to travel. So it's, it's, yeah. it's literally that, so to Brian's point, it's that shut down. But um, my son is a consultant for a major company and he hasn't traveled in, well, he came here, but other than that, um, he hasn't traveled for business since February. And the project that he's working on is getting further and further behind because it involves about 4,000 people. And it's really hard to keep 4,000 people, to Brian's point, on, you can't put them all in the software at one time. You've got to be there. So it, 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 so it is getting behind. So I'm not so sure that we, we are completely stopped now, but I think at some point people are going to have to eventually, remember the old American Airlines commercial? Like you're not seeing people and the guy hands out the airline ticket. Remember that one? I'm probably dating myself with that, but it's true. You've got to go out and see people. Yeah, I'll add, well, let me say one thing quickly. I started out my career in a consulting firm, and, and I took vacations for eight years <laughs> on, uh, on the frequent flyer miles yeah. that I accumulated in right. three right. of work, and we're very glad Van got on a plane and got down here. Yeah. Working in Washington, D.C., you see an awful lot of travel back and forth. Has D.C. started to open back up at all yet? Not really. When I came to the airport yesterday, I mean, you know, the, um, uh, there was only one terminal open, uh, to leave D.C., the restaurants were shut down, but uh, no. But I, but I agree with what Brian said. I think it's going to be a new normal. People have been productive uh, in a lot of the jobs, but there are some jobs that you've got to have that interaction and in, in, in true team building yes. to accomplish yeah. the mission. So I think it's going to be a, a new normal. Yes, I, uh, absolutely. Siri? Question for you, Van. What are your impressions of LifeLock and equivalent types of services for individuals? <laughs> So clearly that's one that was an early company that anticipated this. And it, it always strikes me that uh, there's, there's an old saying that somebody's misfortune is another person's gain. So with the same rise in threats to personal security, that became a business opportunity for someone or some company, some group of people to help solve that problem. So yes, it's, a, uh, it's just like that. If you see these problems arising, you can anticipate them and start a successful business. There's an old saying in strategy that I'm gonna get approximately right, and that is that a decent strategy in a growing market segment is a lot better than a great strategy in a declining market segment. Okay. And the final question, um, although it's hard to have a crystal ball, what might we expect to see in the financial markets over the next six months? Ah, yes, the perennial oh, financial geez. market. <laughs> 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 
Professor Rubin. This what, isn't. A, we're going to shut the tape off, right? Yeah. This is the. This is the one that every. You can't have a financial services uh, kind of panel without asking people what they see coming over the next few months. So. Professor Rubin, what do you see coming over the next few months? Well, the patterns for pandemics and crises over the last 40 years have always shown a, a W recovery, which basically comes down and it will come back up, but it just comes down again at some point in the future, whether it's six months or a year after the, the increase, you know, after the comeback, if you will. That's what, that's what the patterns show. And, you know, we talk about that you, mm. you can't fight history. It's always, you know, going to repeat it. So... I just Interesting. A W-shaped recovery. So we're, are we, we're at the first peak. We're coming right. back. We've gone down and coming yeah. back. What do you see, Brian? I think I'm the Nike guy. I'm going with the swoosh. <laughs> Low up. up. Very good. Very good. Van? I'm just listening to Professor Rubin and Professor Evans. <laughs> Van, if anybody on this group was going to have, if they were going to have a V-shaped recovery, I figured it would be Van and <laughs> Well, we're, in, um, we're in it right now. Listen, absolutely. It's, uh, it, well, it's a great pleasure to have all of you here. Thank you for making the time, sharing your thoughts, sharing your wisdom with us. This is why it's so much fun for me to be the dean uh, and have great guests here and have a great staff putting things together. So my uh, thanks to everyone that's here on the other side uh, of the, the camera <laughs> and to all of our people out in the audience. Great to, great to see all of you and have those comments. We'll be doing a series of these over the summer on different topics, but we'll be having at least one more uh, in finance with a few of our other finance professors uh, and some other individuals. So a little different perspective, but thank you all for being here. It's great fun. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for Alzi. Ah, <laughs> yes. Hey.